Hi, everyone. Welcome to David Wheatley's podcast, episode 23. We are in the go mode over here. We are recording three in one day. I'd heard that Jeopardy records five in one day, although I'm skeptical and that has not been substantiated, but we can definitely substantiate that we are trying to record three in one day. So I was looking over the notes from the prior podcasts and I noticed the reference to podcast in my asserting that this is not a cat show. Uh, nevertheless, the word podcast is wryly, if not lightly, amusing to me and hopefully to others, so I wanted to invoke that at the beginning of this episode. A while back, and I hope you won't start snoozing because I said a while back, I decided to open up a brokerage account with an online brokerage that also happened to have a few isolated standing alone brokerage offices. And in the course of visiting with this fellow up in Santa Barbara, California, I asked him the question, how do you decide which stocks to invest in? And how do you value them? So he says, well, he didn't say funny you should ask, but it had that sort of a, I sensed a Southern drawl inside him, even though it came out California chic. And he said that there are three main ways. One is the financial analysis, another is the technical analysis, and the third is the behavioral analysis. So it sounds interesting. Tell us more. So the financial analysis is a snapshot of the value of something in his particular world, a stock, most normally. And I'm going to endeavor to tie this into music and intellectual property. I'll move the mic in a little bit. The clompers are not here too, but the rollers are here. I hear something being rolled around upstairs, which is part of the charm of working here. It's a moment of respect for the rollers and the clompers. So valuations, the financial analysis is a snapshot of how, let's say, a company or an entity or a piece of intellectual property is doing at that moment. So, and it's usually the balance sheet, which is the asset. What what did it cost to buy it? Let's say a share of stock is worth $100, selling for $100, so you can buy it for $100. So that's the financial analysis. There might be some other numbers to look at, which is what is the actual value of this outfit of the company? Maybe it's $100 million, which sounds like a lot to most of us who live in a checking account world. But still, $100 million, maybe that's what their assets are. If they sold them all on one day, they would get that for it. And if they paid all their creditors, maybe they pay their creditors $80 million, which also sounds like a huge number, and they would be left with twenty. So this is the snapshot on this particular day. In fact, let's not even make it Monday. Let's say right this moment, they sold everything, paid everybody off, or left with $20 million. That's the financial analysis. Do they owe more? Do they owe 120 And they would still owe 20 even after they sold it. Or do they get $100 million for selling it, and they pay out 20 and they're left with 80 so that's the financial analysis. It's a snapshot. The second one is the technical analysis, like I just said, which is more of a movie. It's a video where you look at how it was doing on the first of last month, and how is it doing on the first of this month, and how did those numbers trend? Did the asset values go up or down? Did the revenues that came in, did they go up or down? Same with the costs, up or down. Liabilities, which are the debts, up or down. And from this short time period of a month, it's possible to project into the future how these numbers are likely to go. And so let's say we have a piece of intellectual property that costs $1,000 to make it, paying people, studios, engineers, editors, put in 1000 bucks for that. And on that particular day, that piece of intellectual property is worth 1000 and if you borrowed the money from somewhere else, a thousand bucks, then that would be the liability. That's, those are the people you'd have to pay. So that asset, the net worth would be zero, which is bad. You want it to always end up being a positive number, ideally as big as possible. And so the technical analysis shifts as this intellectual property starts to generate revenues. 
as of the first of the next month, it could be worth two thousand, and the amount that borrow the person borrowed is still a thousand. So two thousand minus one thousand would equal a thousand dollars in net worth. So it'd be trending upwards with the revenues. And intellectual property projects often have surges of interest as they are launched. And then there's a gradual decline, or in some cases, a precipitous decline after that. And all of this needs to be factored into developing projects. So that's the technical analysis. The third one, this guy said he thought was the most interesting, but he didn't quite know what to do with it, which is the behavioral analysis, which ties directly into psychology that we've talked about, social psychology, and how groups of people behave. So the intellectual property... It could be so catchy and have such a great hook and be so topical that it jumps on a wave of popular opinion, supporting popular opinion, and that many people would like to pay to download it or to buy CDs, more likely LPs, in order to show their commitment to a particular idea or cause. And if there are enough sales, then the valuation of the asset goes from 1000 to, let's say, 10000 over a period of a month. So I'll just pause for uh, how great it is when that happens. At the same time, uh, the public can decide that they're no longer interested in that particular cause, or the project gets canceled because of a competing group identifies it as a threat and decides to put the word out to their community that this project that is doing so well is not worthy of that. And instead, the public should be paying attention to the group that's doing the canceling. So this is part of uh, evaluations of projects and intellectual property. How does a person or a company go about protecting their asset from cancellation? I have not had to think about this that much although maybe someday I will, maybe from this podcast or any of the episodes, somebody will jump on them. But I've endeavored to be non-controversial but interesting. You'll let me know how I'm doing. And so the uh, when I was first putting together intellectual pr property projects, the uh, PR people and the people writing marketing copy suggested that I present them as being alternatives to what's already available, which is in a way complementary of the status quo while at the same time offering an alternative. However, this has changed in the cancel culture to completely dismiss the status quo and anything that's new. I didn't say that quite right, but close to it. I think you know what I mean. So there's no acknowledgement. It's a complete dis of the other project, the people, their lives, everything they've ever done. It's a very, very harsh approach to uh, marketing. And a lot of people are oblivious to the fact that it is marketing. And it's an attempt to denigrate the value of an asset and the net worth of an asset by using criticism, public criticism. So the way around that would be to have a marketing plan held in reserve that's available to refute any cancellation that comes down with the project's own cancellation attacks of the other people. So it's a different world. I keep saying that because I'm partly trying to adjust to the meanness of cancel culture, as are a lot of people. So, um, so this is uh, what I have to say about valuations of assets. It's not everything I have to say, but the stand-up comic world, I keep saying world, has to decide, let's say a stand-up comic in particular, needs to decide what is going to be in their act. Because a lot of criticism, a lot of humor is related to criticism and creating cognitive dissonance and pointing out disparities, hypocrisy, and showing that the audience is way cooler than all these other people that are being referred to. Well, these other people being referred to aren't too happy about being referred to in a critical format. They're uh, often ready to just jump in and work the cancellations. One way around this that I've seen is that a stand-up will say that they're going to uh, be critical and make fun of, is the terminology, every group. 
So then the cancel people are confused about who to actually cancel because this, the comic actually supports what the cancelers, is that even a word, are doing. So it's hard for the cancelers to both be complimented and dissed at the same time, and they get confused. Still, it goes on. Tough to be a comic these days, but it can be done. And with that, conundra, dichotomy, and ambiguity, we're going to bring this episode to a close, episode 23. Thank you for joining us. David Wheatley10 at gmail.com. Please send emails and remark upon whatever you this makes you think about remarking upon. Please go to patreon.com. Send us money because we like that and to keep everything going. So with that, I wish you all the best. And that concludes episode 23.